There is something profoundly wrong when African American men are still far more likely to be stopped and searched by police, charged with crimes, and sentenced to longer prison terms than are meted out to their white counterparts. There is something wrong when a third of all black men face the prospect of prison during their lifetimes. It is all about fault. Whose fault is Baltimore? Who is to blame for the rioting, the looting, the unrest that is not just this city, but every major urban area in America on edge at the moment? As with anything in need of inspection, the answers are never easy and never right out in the open. They go back years, maybe decades, and defy those who are quick to point fingers at money, color, or background as the fault. Our guest is author of The Long Shadow, Family Background, Disadvantaged Urban Youth, and the Transition to Adulthood. Carl Alexander. Carl, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Ed. I appreciate you reaching out to me. My pleasure. You and your researchers, fellow researchers at John Hopkins, you tracked 790 Baltimore school kids for a quarter century. Out of that study, when you first got your hands on it, what is it that made you go, this is the reason for what's going on? Well, I, uh, there's not a there's not a single reason. Uh, so I just I have to say that there's a there's a host of issues that come into play. Uh, we did follow this track of follow this group of youngsters, typical Baltimore City public school children, for 25 years from when they started first grade in 1982 until they were age 28, 29. Uh, so it's quite a broad sweep. I think there were two issues that really jump out and uh, and commanded our attention, and I think uh, ought to be of interest to everyone. Uh, when we step back and we try to take stock of the big picture. The book really uh, develops two success narratives revolving around family resources and the opportunities that families are able to provide for their children. One has to do with the opportunity to move up uh, by uh, using the school as a springboard for, for oppor of opportunity. Um, yeah, that's what we tell our students, our children, they ought to do. Uh, Play by the rules, listen to your teachers, listen to your parents, work hard, and, uh, and things will work out fine at the end. Well, they don't always work out fine. And what we, what we found was that when we, when we talked to the, uh, our study participants at age 28, as young adults, and asked them to reflect back on their educational experiences and the details of it, uh, the children we classify as low-income families as first graders, that's about half the total, 400 youngsters, including 45% of those are white, by the way, the white poor uh, often they're missing from the scene when we talk about urban poverty, but they're in large they're there in large numbers in Baltimore and in other cities like Baltimore. So when we asked everybody about their educational experiences as of age 28, we found that just four percent of the low-income children, four percent, had completed a bachelorate degree by then, a four-year degree, uh, and that compares to 45 percent of the children from middle-class families. And these are not super wealthy families. These are families that had their children in Baltimore City Public Schools back in the early 80s. Well, let me interrupt if I can so, for a moment, Carl, because you're hitting on something here right now which talks about almost none of the kids from low-income families made it through college. The study is filled with findings such as these. But I guess yeah. what we want to follow is here, hasn't all this been obvious for decades? Well, it's been obvious, and point of fact, as you say, this, uh, this tracks national data very clearly. But, but we are able to drill down at it down into it, I think, in a way that most others are not able to because of the long time frame of our coverage. Um, and so I, th I think there are lessons to be learned. Uh, for example, you know, many of our, many of our children, our low-income children, struggled academically. That's no big surprise either. Um, but the comparison's really quite, and it's not only academic challenges that stand in their way, but let me mention academics. Yeah, I got about two uh, minutes here, and I want to make grade, sure we get a couple of things oh, in, Carl. I got about two minutes, please. So go ahead. Tell us about the academics. Okay. About a minute. Well, at the end of, at the end of uh, fifth grade, as the end of elementary school, the typical low-income child was three grade levels behind in reading comprehension on standardized test scores. Three grade levels behind before middle school. That's her. That's a horrible place to be. But in point of fact, all of that increase in the achievement gap across social lines uh, during the elementary school years traces to differential summer learning when children are out of school. So one lesson is that these children, when they're in school, keep up tolerably well. They're capable learners. But during the long summer break, when they're cut off from the school's resources, they're not able to move ahead because their parents don't have the understandings and the, and the skills to help them continue to, to move ahead. Then let's look so at this then, Carl. I, I want to make sure that we get this in because there's so much data here, and I really think that people need to read a lot more into this. 
but about a minute or so that I have left here, all the data that you found and everything here, what then speaks to you as the solution? Let's stop placing blame for a moment here and let's get down no, and I, drill I, down I, to a solution. I, thank you, I, I appreciate that. I'm not into the blame game. Two things, uh, help more poor children, black and white, realize greater success in school, uh, to help them do the things their parents want to do and that most of them want to do as well. And there are all sorts of challenges that stand in the way. The second big takeaway point, which we hardly have time to get to, is that the children who did not go on to college as young adults, African Americans uh, had far fewer employment opportunities compared to the low-income whites who started out in life in very, very similar kinds of circumstances. Um, almost half of the white, white men of working class background at age 28 were employed in the remnants of Baltimore's industrial and construction trades, high skill, high wage work, uh, plumbers, electricians, uh, auto mechanics, and the like. Only 15% of Afri African Americans had employment in that sector of the economy. And within that sector, African Americans earned half of what the whites were earning. And so even those who managed to get into the area, into the sector of the economy that potentially uh, could lead to a comfortable, successful, you know, secure life ec ec economically, even those, they were substantially relegated to the low skill, low wage, dirty work in that sector, which I harkens back generations. I wanted to point out one thing, and I wasn't saying that you were not getting to it because everybody else is looking for blame. That's it. So I wanted to make sure that we use this ah, and tell well, people that there you. is a reason that. here to find solutions. As you said, this view is at odds with the popular ethos that we are makers of our own fortune. Again, the book I want to point people to, make sure you pick it up, The Long Shadow, Family Background, Disadvantaged Urban Youth, and the Transition to Adulthood. Carl Alexander is the author. Carl, thank you so much for joining us, and The Hard Line will continue.